Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started um, since I know that I need to take a couple of minutes to uh, thank the sponsors and all of that. I'm going to get going um, now if I can. Um, thrilled to have you here today to talk a little bit about what it means to envision um, the global schoolhouse for the 21st century. Um, this presentation is actually designed um, very specifically to uh, be used outside of this setting as well with your faculty. So I'm just going to clarify um, that there are several slides where I invite uh, thinking, conversation, and process uh, that are really more designed for you to use with your faculty back at your schools more than in the setting, because in 30 minutes we're not actually going to be able to address those questions. Um, but I wanted to put together a recording that you all uh, could use in your own schools um, at your leisure, of course, you know, and use the questions that you want and, you know, you even not use the recording if you prefer to deliver those questions yourself. So I want to thank everybody, of course, for being here. Uh, my name is Jennifer uh, Klein, uh, and I am a global educator, consultant. I do a million different things, quite honestly. Um, and I'm thrilled to be here as part of Global Leadership Day today uh, to share a few of my insights and hopefully some tools that you can use in your schools. I want to thank, first of all, all the sponsors of this event. We've, uh, this is an exciting uh, opportunity uh, for so many educators to share ideas with each other. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do that without the partnership of these sponsors. So a big shout out to them. Let's take a moment, too, and find out where people are connecting from. So if you can click on the pointer, um, the star in particular is your best bet, and identify where you are on the map. That would be perfect. Oops, I guess clicking it again takes it away. I am connecting right now myself from Denver, Colorado, which is where I live when I'm home, which is not very often, but <laughs> when I am. Oh, no tools yet. Huh, OK, hang on one second. Let me make sure that everybody is given the, the, okay, give it a try now. See if that works. Thank you for noticing that, Barbara. Or somebody, Peggy, pardon me. See if that works now. Are you able to identify? Perfect. I see somebody marking where they're from. You can also put it into the chat box if that's easier for you. <laughs> the arrow worked very nicely for Florida. That was very good. Excellent. Well, that's great. It's good to have all of you here. Um, and I'm, I'm certainly very excited to share just a few insights, but also, most importantly, um, I hope anyway, some tools that you can use with your own teachers. So again, this presentation was developed for your use in the school um, more than uh, just for this occasion. So I'm very hopeful that the resources and questions that I'm asking uh, will be helpful to you, and thank you, Peggy, for being here as well. Uh, thank you to all of you for being here um, and uh, being part of this conversation. I'll try to keep a, an eye on the chat but uh, as, as we go, and, and please feel free to raise your hand if I ignore you or don't see uh, your raise, uh, that you're uh, putting questions into the box. So I want to start, of course, by um, describing the world as it is right now. Um, this, this particular acronym, VUCA, comes from the US military and is described as an acronym for um, that is designed to, to describe the current state of the world. And when we think about our students and the kind of preparation that they're going to need for the 21st century and beyond, um, it's pretty clear that they're going to need a whole lot more than just content skills. And I know that everybody who's a part of this conversation right now knows that um, and appreciates the complexity of the world that we're living in. But I think that this um, acronym does a really nice job, actually, of, of very accurately describing our current state of the world, which is a world filled with volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And my, in my opinion, the kinds of programs that we're designing uh, need to be global, certainly, but they also need to provide students with the skills in particular to confront and not just survive a VUCA world, but really be able to thrive within the complexity that we have um, in this particular world right now. So, I wanted to also to start by sharing um, the words of Boyan Slot. Um, and Boyan Slot is actually not much of a celebrity, except that he is the young man in um, Holland who has come up potentially with a solution to how to clean up the plastic from the gyres all over our planet. Um, he was inspired at 16 when he was snorkeling in Greece and saw more uh, plastic than fish. At 17, he developed the very first model for a plastic uh, 
cleaner or a gyre cleaner um, as part of the science fair in this high school. And now at 21 is doing some extraordinary work. Actually, he's crowdfunded um, his plan. They are building the first pilot, the first actual um, uh, cleanup system, um, which they expect to be piloted either in 2016 or early 2017. And I think I love the quotation, of course, Peggy, you're totally right. It's a beautiful, beautiful line. Um, but I also want to point out this young man is the same as any of our students. This young man doesn't have anything over any of our students in terms of his capacity to create change. And I think that's what's most exciting right now, is that we're in a moment when our educational systems can really foster uh, this kind of thinking and the kind of initiative that young men like Boy and Slat have, have used. So I certainly encourage you to take a look at his TED Talks and other videos on the work that he's doing. But most importantly, to remember, as he says, that history is a series of things people thought were impossible until they happened. And that we are in a position to really provide our kids with the skills necessary to be part of those movements of change. Now, uh, Will Richardson is uh, an educator I've gotten to spend a little bit of time with whose ideas I really like. And he talks a lot about what's changed in our world and in our educational systems or what might need to change um, given that we're living in a world of abundant information and kids can access information anywhere they want um, from their phones, from, from all resources, and very, very easy to find things, of course. Um, so he talks about the fact that we've got um, concepts that are harder and easier to assess, and then we've also got concepts that are less important and more important to survival in that VUCA world. And what he notices is that um, we have, if you look, take a good look for a moment, if you would, at all of the things that we consider to be very, very hard to assess and very, very important to learn. And the reality is that we are, um, sorry, this is, yeah, I've got a little bit of a delay on my end here with the slides, so pardon my little pauses. Um, that he, uh, Will Richardson describes all of these as um, what he calls immeasurables. We tend, and it's not too surprising that we do this, but we tend in schools to focus on the things that are easier to assess. But in doing so, we're also focusing on the things that may actually be a whole lot less important, given that kids can pick up their phones today and find access to almost all the information that we previously considered essential knowledge to have, um, we need to be able to move into these immeasurables. And of course, it is much harder to teach curiosity, and it's much harder to teach um, uh, empathy, and it's certainly much harder to assess courage or resilience, but that these immeasurables are really the heart of what we need to be giving our kids. And if we stay focused on content knowledge and skills, that we are often missing this really rich and important essential uh, piece of the puzzle. So what I want to encourage, of course, is that you take this, this deck back to your um, classes, to your um, constituencies, and have a little bit of a conversation about this. Really think a bit about the why behind your school and your existence. Um, think about your current school mission or vision statement. Make sure that it aligns with and captures your global goals and the way that you see uh, education in the 21st century. And then I want to also encourage you to think beyond your current mission or vision statement and choose a few immeasurables from the slide before that you really feel would, would be of value. If they're not already in your mission statement, and I certainly hope that some of them are, uh, I would very much encourage you to go in and really dig into your own mission statement and think a bit about some of those words that we saw in the upper quadrant of that last that might actually be even more valuable in certain ways um, than some of the things that we've previously considered. Um, uh, yeah, and of course, it, it is, yes, I think you're totally right, Peggy, that there's a fear of how to measure immeasurables. That's a pretty, you know, obviously that's going to be challenging. But perhaps it's more important that we're teaching them that we're, than that we're able to measure them. In other words, I would say that we've gotten so assessment um, uh, focused that we've forgotten that it doesn't always matter whether we can assess the things that we do with students, that what's most important is that we know that they matter. Um, and so whether or not we're able to assess them and put them easily into a grade, um, into a box on a, on a grade sheet, um, that we remember that these are the things that we became educators for, most of us. So. All right, so the next point that I want to talk about is, is student-directed learning and what I consider to be the key pedagogies when it comes to uh, 21st century education um, and really creating those global educators like Boy and Slot that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, they tend to be student-driven. 
um, which means that they're project-based or problem-based or challenge-based, inquiry-based, whatever uh, acronym you like to play around with, that the kids are more in charge of the learning and that when you walk into a classroom, you hear kids 20, uh, you hear kids 80% of the time and teachers 20% of the time as opposed to the reverse, which tends to be more common. Um, that our orientation is toward solutions and action, um, that kids' op opportunities and experiences are authentic and relevant. Um, I'm a big believer in global learning and this idea of connecting the global to the local and making sure, especially with younger students, that kids do have a chance to really, you know, if they're learning about a global issue, that they're getting a chance to do something about it on a local level um, or to explore the culture more fully on a local level. Um, and then also that, it, that the work we're doing is tech-enabled, not tech driven, meaning that I think we get often very obsessed with the tools themselves um, and we forget that what it really needs to be about is the learning and the connection and the building of relationships between our students and young people uh, around the world. So I wanted to share some results that I, I really found this very fascinating. This is, this was a, uh, these results come from a youth summit that was done um, uh, by the Wisconsin Global um, Organization. There are a lot of folks in Wisconsin who have been doing global education a lot longer than a lot of folks in the United States. And in February of 2013, they did a lovely um, youth summit as part of their um, yearly conference with students. And they asked young people in middle school and high school what they want from their schools and communities, what they envision the best global programming possible, what is it that kids want. I'm such a big believer in student voice that I really want to start from them um, because I really think that if we're meeting the needs of students, we're going to have engaged, excited learners and that's all anybody would ever ask. So I'm going to walk through their four main points that the students came up with as the key things that they think this kind of programming needs. The first one is that they feel that we should be offering a diversity of world, language um, world languages in our schools with opportunities for really authentic use. Um, and they pointed out that, you know, it's, it's odd and ironic, for example, that we, within medicine, I'm sorry, within music, within athletics, um, within many fields, we know that we need to start kids very, very young. You know, you don't expect a kid to pick up a violin at 14 and, and learn to be a, an extraordinary, extraordinary violinist necessarily. Um, and yet we do that with world language all the time. <laughs> um, we wait until very, very late in the process to offer it. Or, as some students of mine pointed out, we do offer it early, but we repeat the same things over and over again. So by the time that kids get to eighth grade, they've memorized the colors, the numbers, the days of the week, and the months of the year um, 20 or 30 times, <laughs> but have never really been invited to go beyond that. Um, and so I think it's really, really essential, and they were pointing this out as well, um, that we really need to offer more of a variety of languages and more opportunities to really use them. Um, that, that we often teach language in a vacuum in the United States, particularly um, for this, you know, studying for tests and <laughs> things like that, um, without really making it about the use of the language. And that, of course, we need to be diversifying which languages are being offered in our schools. The second point that students made was that they'd like to see us increase the direct engagement that they have the opportunity to have, whether that's through travel or through exchange students coming into the schoolhouse. This particular group of students was predominantly public school from public school, and so from their experience, most of their, their significant global experiences had come from um, exchanges, exchange students coming into their schools because they had been unable to do travel themselves much yet. Um, so finding ways to build those direct engagements and opportunities for kids to really meet other people. And yes, Peggy, sorry if that wasn't clear, that's a direct engagement with people in other countries um, and from other cultures. Actually, I would make the clarification it's not always about other countries. It also includes exploring, in my opinion anyway, I think it also ex includes exploring indigenous culture in our own country as well and the multitude of, of different cultures that we have now living um, in, our, um, on the, in the United States or in North America wherever you might be in the world, of course, um, that uh, a lot of it is about creating opportunities for engagement with people in other places, um, but also the, the various cultures that might be missed or misunderstood in our own countries as well. The next point that they made uh, was that they would like to see us connecting with the world far more through technology. And I think this, you know, this is a bit of a no-brainer at this point. There are so many different 
um, platforms and organizations out there. I'm a, a big fan of taking it global. I work, I continue to work with them a bit through their Future Friendly School Network, um, and I really believe that they're on the right track. But in general, what kids were saying was, you know, the, the ability to create those direct engagements is so, so high, um, and it's fairly direct, actually, to connect with others through technology. So we should be doing a whole lot more of it, in the opinion of the kids, because it's quite easy to do. Not always easy to find the partners and all of that, of course. But um, And then the last point they made was that they would like their schools to foster open-mindedness uh, open and to promote awareness and acceptance. And what I love about this is that they didn't choose to use the word tolerance. Um, so often I hear, uh, when I do workshops with adults, the majority of the time, uh, tolerance is one of the key terms that comes up very early in the work. And I'm not suggesting that I think tolerance is a bad goal, but I do think it's a very low bar to set. I think we can go a whole lot deeper than tolerance, um, because tolerance suggests that we hate each other but don't tell each other <laughs> that we put up with each other. Um, and I think the way the kids put it is so much more powerful. When we think about open-mindedness, awareness, and acceptance, it creates a very different tone and intent than the word tolerance does. Um, I also really appreciated this statement from Susie Boss's work, um, that it's not enough for students to have ideas coming out of their ears, but that they also need to know what to do next to put a worthy idea into action, and that teaching students how to innovate is about both thinking and doing. So I think this is particularly true in global education, that we need to create avenues for action, um, avenues for kids to do something with the ideas that they have. There's nothing more paralyzing, actually, for kids than to discover the complexities of the world and how uncertain and volatile it really is and not feel like they can do anything about it. So I think that it, it behooves us as educators to make sure that there are avenues for taking those ideas and emotional reactions to the world and really helping kids find ways to do something with that and to be a constructive part of creating change when they feel that something is wrong. So this would be the, next, the second slide for you to share or consider sharing with faculty to have a conversation about. Um, what are you, your community's current strengths? And where do you see opportunities for growth in those four key points made by the students when it comes to the diversity of world languages, travel and exchange, connecting through technology, and fostering open-mindedness, awareness, and acceptance. And I encourage you to have these conversations, as I said before, um, with your faculty within your communities to see if you can identify some of the areas that are working for you right now, but also to identify some areas that you want to intentionally focus on improving. So I know that this portion is not necessarily, oh, thank you, Peggy, for providing the link. Peggy has provided the link to the original um, blog, which was uh, is awesome of you. Thank you so much for doing that. I really appreciate it. Um, so you can take a look at the blog that was an overview of that youth summit um, from 2013, if you'd like. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very good blog. Um, I've quoted it in some of my articles, actually. It's, it's very nicely done. Um, so the reimagined schoolhouse, of course, is not just a global issue. And I recognize, I want to just be super clear right at the beginning, I recognize that most schools um, are challenged when it comes to the finances necessary to create new schoolhouses. But I also think that even in our oldest, most jail-like buildings, we, there are things that we can do um, to create different sorts of learning spaces. This one's obviously an extraordinary example. Um, this is the career, um, uh, the career school uh, in Dallas, Texas, the Dubisky High School, um, which it doesn't look like a high school at all. It has lots and lots of open spaces, um, lots and lots of light, um, and different sitting areas for kids in various places. This one also comes from John Dubisky High School. Um, Career High School, um, they've really gone out of their way to create a space, <laughs> yes, it's amazing, and it's a public school, just to be clear. Um, they've done a really beautiful job of, um, of uh, really recreating how the school feels um, or how a, any sort of school feels, um, and is uh, they're really just doing a lovely job of creating an environment that feels much more like a career space than like a school space, um, but that also is incredibly, incredibly flexible. And Paul, you're asking what about the virtual out-of-classroom learning. Well, I've talked a little bit about that, but I am going to get to the, the technology piece right here, 
well-timed. Um, the other piece, of course, of what our schoolhouses need are a whole lot of um, the technologies necessary for the connections, um, for, for kids to really be able to connect with people in other parts of the world. Um, and that includes all sorts of things. It includes the, elect the electrical plugs and convenience spots. Um, it includes, you know, video conferencing suites if you want to do that. As you see in the upper corner, the, that's a group of Palestinian poets Skyping. Um, and the young woman on the screen is at Colorado Academy here in Denver. Um, but I've also, I, I want to clarify too, I think there are so many ways that they can, that you can create um, opportunities for connection uh, without having a whole lot of money. In other words, I know that some of the examples I'm showing are quite fancy, but I also think, I'm, you know, more and more people are able to do all sorts of amazing things with just a laptop, as you see in the, in the uh, picture in the lower right. Um, I'm not actually familiar with the Starbucks classroom, um, Barbara. It makes me nervous even hearing the term, um, only because I'm a little nervous about um, corporate America getting their fingers into education too much, but, um, but I don't know much about it either. Um, and I don't know what, you know, it's a good question about John Dubisky. I would encourage you to reach out if you're curious. I believe that they do um, open the school and do community events um, on the weekends and things like that in the evenings as well um, so that it's used by more of the community. Um, and certainly because it's a career high school, uh, you know, they have, they've really made a lot of effort to put, um, Oh, I see what you're saying, Barbara. I'm sorry. Not so much about the corporate thing, but about the ambiance. Yeah. Well, I think the examples that I was just showing um, show a bit of that, that comfortable ambiance where kids can sit and relax um, and, and really feel at home. Um, so many of our schools are, uh, really do feel like jails to the kids. And I, I was, I've been amazed over the years by how many students have referred to their schoolhouses as feeling jail-like. So I think anything we can do to sort of open the windows and, um, it, in a metaphorical way, if you will, um, is going to help kids. Um, and so this would be the next slide for conversation in your schoolhouses. Um, identify three, ideally, if you can, identify three to five physical site concerns that you think you could address immediately. And when I say site concerns, you know, it could be if you're dealing with a site that really can't be adapted to the extreme that we just saw in some of those images, maybe it's as simple as um, moving toward uh, the tables that can be moved easily and reconfigured for small or large groups. Um, maybe it means uh, more of those active sitting stools for the boys who get so jumpy, and the girls too, frankly, uh, who get so wiggly in class. Uh, maybe it includes having some standing desks as well as sitting desks, but just a, a much more flexible environment in general, I think, is what's key, uh, so, that it, so that school doesn't feel like an uncomfortable place to be, and so that we can be flexible, especially when we're doing collaborative learning and global connecting, um, that our spaces are flexible enough to really make that work well and easily. There are, of course, many challenges to this kind of change, and I'm not going to be, I'm not going to have enough time to go into all of this in a, a whole lot of depth, but, you know, community buy-in is a really key piece. You can tell when you look at the pictures of John Dubisky Career School, High School, that they've got some serious funding behind them, and you know that that's not just district funding. That's going to be community funding as well, because the community is bought into the concept of doing this work. Um, it means creating global and local partnerships, which is not always easy to do. Um, I was just over at the Denver Center for International Studies in Montbello, though, here in the Denver area today and yesterday, and I have to say that I think local partners as well as global partners can do a great deal to help to globalize a schoolhouse and a curriculum um, without requiring that people um, spend a whole lot of money. Oftentimes global partners are so excited to have access, I'm sorry, local partners, um, local organizations doing global work or doing important work in the community are so excited to have access to the schools and, and an opportunity to connect with schools um, that they're glad to do it for free. And of course global partnerships are among the most important things that we can build for the global uh, classroom. Uh, I, I'm actually working on a book right now for Solution Tree Press which will be out next year um, just on the topic of global partnerships because I believe it's an essential piece of the puzzle and it's certainly not easy to do. Um, I, another challenge is uh, rigid educational structures and expectations. Um, I'm, not an, I'm not in disagreement with the concept of the standards movement, but I do think that we are so focused on testing that that often impedes our ability to be creative. And it certainly scares the 
pants off of any teacher who's worried about their job. Um, in other words, I think it's very hard to be creative when you're nervous about the, the circumstances around you and the expectations. So I meet a lot of teachers, for example, who say, you know, project-based learning sounds really exciting, Jennifer, but what about that test at the end of the year? What if my kids don't do as well? They want to take the risk, but they're scared to. And I think they're, I understand why they're scared. Um, so that can get in the way sometimes of this more creative programming. Another piece, of course, is deep, relevant training for teachers. We have to make sure that they're getting access to really high quality professional development, and not just episodic professional development, but the opportunity to work with a coach over time to really dig deeper and deeper into a topic um, and to really get um, deep training that's as personalized as possible so that the teachers are supported as they move toward their goals. And then, of course, the last two are the hardest and the most important, and those are time and money. Um, creating space in the, in the schedule for teachers to collaborate. Having a flexible enough schedule so that kids can be dismissed from other classes or released from other classes in order to make sure that they can all attend a video conference or a big event that's happening on campus. You know, really building in the, the time for these things to occur is really key. And then, of course, the money is also key. But I, I think a big, big part of what I'm discovering is that people who educate and who work in, in global fields tend to do so with such a deep sense of passion and purpose that oftentimes it's not about the money. It's about sharing their ideas. It's about growing something new. Um, it's about inspiring young people to get involved in the fields that they themselves care so much about. Um, so I think you know a lot a lot of people out there are more than willing to donate their time because it matters to them to see young people moving into these kinds of work. I know that I'm coming to the end of the time. I am going to go ahead and finish up the slides. Um, so it's up to you if you're able. I hope you're able to stay, of course. But um, so this would be the slide for having a conversation about change with your teachers or with your administrators. Think ahead a bit to the potential challenges you see in your own community when it comes to creating deep change. And I really want to encourage you to spend some time identifying a few strategies that you think might help you to navigate those challenges. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example, too, of a subtle strategy. I re, um, at one point was doing a lot of work bringing Palestinian voices into the classroom. Um, and it was a, a tricky, tricky piece of work to do because there were often parents who, as well as students, who were uncomfortable with the perspectives being shared. And so one of the strategies I used was to invite parents to the video conferences and to invite them into these experiences as much as possible. And I found that that really actually did help. It was scary and hard for me to do, um, but it really did help to create a, um, a feeling that the parents were part of it as opposed to my doing it behind the parents' back, um, backs. And so that really did help quite a bit. Um, Peggy, I mean, just taking a look at your question, when you start a conversation like this in your school, do you start with some kind of self-assessment? And then you do, uh, yeah, I mean, I certainly that, I think a self-assessment certainly makes sense. You know, maybe it's just as simple, though, as a short reflective question and having your teachers sit down and just write for a minute or two what are some of the things that, that make change hard for them. Um, what is it about change that, that, that they find challenging? Um, uh, or what are some of the things that, that they think are not working in the school? Um, but then make sure that they also spend some time reflecting on what they think the solutions are so that that conversation isn't just a great session um, but is really a, a deep conversation about what's working. Uh, when it comes to global surveys, I haven't found a perfect one, but I really do like um, the American Forum for Global Education created a survey. I think it's as old as 2002, but it's, it's still a very good one for getting a read on what's working and what's not working uh, in a global programming, uh, in the global program. Barbara, what about initiating objectives? What challenges are out there? How do we attempt to target objectives? Yeah, I think that's a great way to approach it as well. Um, Yes, I agree with you totally too, Peggy. I think that, you know, one of the things I've actually discovered recently is that if I start from the positives and then move to the challenges, it doesn't make it, it the, the tone in the room often changes and I don't get quite as many we can't um, because they've started from the positives. So it's, that's a small strategy, but for what it's worth, I do notice that it makes a difference to start from the optimistic and the positive. What are we doing right? What's really working for us already? And then what are the things, and, and also really important to notice that I'm, I think 
one of the frame, the reframes that I've been trying to use more and more lately, because I noticed recently that I, I've noticed recently that I have a slightly more negative um, way of describing things as I, than I would probably prefer to have. Yeah, a little more glass half full, right? Exactly. And my worldview, unfortunately, tends to be a little bit too much half empty. But fortunately, it motivates me to do important work in the world. So it is what it is. Um, but one of the reframings I started doing a couple years ago because of this was to say um, opportunities for change or opportunities for growth rather than challenges or problems. And even just that one semantic um, shift makes quite a big difference, actually, in how a, a topic comes across, right? So we see, we see our problems, if we can see our problems, if you will, as really um, being um, opportunities for growth and something better comes of them. I know that some of you need to, to go on. Of course, I'm going to finish up the slides just to, to offer the, the cap to the whole thing. This is the last quotation that I want to share. Um, this comes from a futurist, Alvin Toffler, who says that the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. I believe that this is as true for us as it is for our students. And it's a really an absolute imperative, I think, of the 21st century that we start to make uh, these shifts if we haven't already, because we're already 16 years into the, into the century, um, and we've got a lot of work to do. So thank you all for being part of this very short, quick conversation. Uh, I hope that the slides are useful, and I hope the questions are useful for for moving your own community forward. Uh, I hope to hear from any of you who would uh, like to connect in the future. And, uh, and thank you so much for being a part of this session. Have a wonderful day.